was 32 years old, but for the majority of my 20s, I didn't have a whole lot of self-worth or self-value. And when you don't have self-worth or self-value, it's impossible to know what your potential is. I grew up in Bismarck, North Dakota, like many of you, I'm sure, and I had a great childhood. I grew up in a typical middle-class family, had a normal relationship with my younger brother, older sister, and my mom, and I had an extraordinary relationship with my dad, who was just my person and my best friend. So playful, so loving, and just this big kid. And life was pretty easy in North Dakota. You don't have to lock your doors at night. You can leave your keys in the car. Uh, I walked to school five blocks away, played with tons of kids, and had a big, you know, a big yard and a bike to play in. And by the time I was 12 years old, I thought I had my entire world figured out. I, was, I used to keep this box underneath my bed, and inside this box I would put pictures of what my life was gonna look like when I got older. So I had this picture of a huge white house with a white picket fence and green shutters, picture of these women who were working and living in New York City, and a picture of this really tall, dark, handsome man who was supposed to be my husband. My boyfriend's 5'10", so you win some and you lose some, right? <laughs> but seriously, I was gonna go to college, get this kick-ass job, I'm just gonna apologize now because I swear a little bit, so I hope I don't offend anybody. <laughs> Have this house, these 2.2 kids, and my life was gonna be perfect. But unfortunately, when I was 16 years old, I got a difficult dose of reality that made me question everything. I was sitting home, it was the summer before my sophomore year in high school, and my dad came home from work early and asked if me and my brother and sister could leave for a little bit so we could talk to our mom. That was a very strange request. My dad is not the let's sit down and have a long conversation type of guy, and he's never asked us to leave the house before. But we all left, I was the first one to come back, and my dad was sitting upstairs on the couch looking somber, embarrassed, and nothing at all like this superhero father figure that I knew so well. And that's the day I learned that my dad was a gambling addict. For the past couple of years, he had been cleverly hiding uh, his behaviors and activities from, from us, and he had just told my mom that he had owed a lot of money to a lot of people that we just didn't have. Unfortunately, that wasn't my dad's first introduction to addiction. He went through drug and alcohol recovery when I was a little kid. I've never seen my dad drink or do drugs. I've frankly never even seen him be tempted by those activities. But my mom did. And for years, she was on the receiving end of my dad's addiction, which comes with deception, lying, cheating, and irresponsibility. Again, words I never would have used to describe my dad. But for her, those memories were incredibly vivid. And she kicked my dad out of the house that day. For a 16-year-old kid who loves her dad more than life, I was pissed off. Here's my broken dad who needs help and fixing, and my mom doesn't want to help him. These feelings of resentment just settled into my bones, and I spent the next three years having a really tough relationship with her, but also trying to fix my dad. I didn't get addiction. I was a 16-year-old kid. Why can't you just stop, get, stop gambling? It's really difficult to love somebody who's an active addict, and my dad was not ready to find a place of recovery. He continued to struggle with his addiction over those next three years, three steps forward, only to take four steps back, and that was when I found running. Thank God. Running was my salvation. I quickly and thankfully got consumed by the lessons that running taught me. I had so much negative emotional energy inside of me that I had to do something with it, and running gave me so much at that time in my life. I learned two very valuable lessons. One, that you have to take life one step at a time. You cannot cheat running. You cannot go out and run 10 miles and run number one and run number 10. That's two miles. <laughs> you, I didn't expect to get claps for that, but I'll take it. You also learn that everybody's on some shitty roads in life. And when you're on shitty roads, you got choices to make. You can either choose to persevere, persevere up that hill in front of you, or you can turn around, or you can go left, or you can go right. And I had all kinds of excuses in my pocket that would make it really easy for me to turn around. My dad's a gambling addict, and everybody knew it. And now my parents were getting divorced. And I didn't know anybody in Bismarck, North Dakota, whose parents got divorced when they were a teenager. It just didn't happen. So I made a decision that I wasn't gonna be a victim of my dad's choices and his behaviors and my, uh, in my broken family. That I was going to go get everything that I put in my box and if I could just get to that place in my box, 
that I would be happy, truly, utterly happy. So I moved a million miles a minute. I went to college. I graduated early with two degrees. I went to graduate school. I graduated early there, too. Found myself living and working in DC. And when I was 24, I got a job offer to move to Philadelphia. Philadelphia was not in my box. However, amazing opportunity for a 24-year-old, so I took it. And from the ages of 24 to 26, I had no idea who I was. It was probably the most difficult time in my life. I felt very alone. I felt very lost. And I had no idea what I was doing. I began to ask myself some of the big questions that we all ask at some point, at least once in our life. What am I doing here? What's my purpose? What is my calling? What's all this mean? I started to question that if, if this life that I had built for myself was even something that I wanted. And that was a really scary place for me because I didn't have a plan B. This was what I was banking on. If I just got to this husband and this house and this job, and I was extremely nervous and I felt paralyzed. And those emotions took over for the next several months, so I did the smartest thing I could think of, and I quit my job. <laughs> I quit my job because I thought I was gonna be forced to figure it out if I took away my security blanket. By this point, I had become a marathoner. I was running every day in Philly at 5.30 in the morning. I felt so good when I was running. I felt so alive, I felt so strong. And there was a homeless shelter about a half a mile away from where I lived. I had literally ran by and walked by this homeless shelter hundreds of times before. And I didn't give a shit about the guys that I saw outside that shelter. But for whatever reason, in May of 2007, these group of guys started to wave at me. And I started to wave back. It's my good Midwestern values. <laughs> Pretty soon, they're saying good morning, and I'm saying good morning, and we have this really fun, sarcastic rapport happening for five to ten, ten seconds as I run, run by them. I used to joke as they would say to me, is all you do is run all day? And I'd say, is all you do is stand there all day? And it was so easy for me to talk to these guys like that for one simple reason, and that was they reminded me so much of my dad, who is sarcastic and funny, but a little rough around the edges. So one day I had an idea. Why am I just running by these guys and leaving them there? Why do I get to be the runner? And they get to be the homeless guys on the corner. Running does not discriminate. It does not matter if you are white, if you are black, if you're rich or you're poor, if you're a messed up 16-year-old kid. And I didn't think it mattered if you were homeless or not. So I, did my, I made up my mind to start a running club for this homeless shelter. I get on the phone, I call the director, I tell him my brilliant idea, and he tries to think of the nicest way to tell me that homeless people don't run. <laughs> so I convince him to at least ask. If you could just ask anybody living in the shelter if they're interested, I'll be there three mornings a week and take care of everything. So he tells me not to get my hopes up, but that he would ask. Well, a week and a half later, I get an email from this gentleman with the names of nine guys in their shoe sizes asking me what's next. I'm super excited. I send an email to anybody I have an email address for, asking for old shoes, clothes, and if you don't have those things, I'll take your money. I was gonna start Philadelphia's first homeless running club. People sent in all kinds of shoes, and I remember looking at these shoes and thinking, you know, I wouldn't run in these. They're old and they're dirty, and what kind of message am I gonna give to these guys if I tell them that these are good enough for them because they're homeless? So I decided that everybody was gonna get a brand new pair of shoes. Right around the same time, I, had been being I was being courted by a, a large Fortune 500 company in Philadelphia. And I got a job offer from them, a very lucrative job offer for a 26-year-old. And if there was any part of me that still wanted this life that I had created for myself as a kid, this was the answer. So I took the job. I took the job and I asked for five weeks if I could just get this idea that I had to help these guys at the shelter get this running club going, that I could get enough people involved that it would be able to work without me when I was traveling. Fortunately, they said yes. So it's the end of June in 2007. I go up to the shelter with my shoes, my clothes, everything I have for these guys to start their running career. And I walk into the chapel, and then, uh, there's nine African-American men sitting in there, and they have no idea some young blonde girl's coming in to run with them. So I get, I get arms crossed looking at me, cockeyed, wondering, who is this girl? I get people winking at me, wondering, who's this girl? I had all these different emotions 
and I had to completely neutralize the room and I opened up about my love for running and my dad and I swear to you, it is if I found my people. I felt so comfortable around these guys. And the most important thing we did that night was I didn't give the, I didn't, I handed out shoes and clothes, but more importantly than that, I asked all these guys to sign a dedication contract that I created on my computer at home. It was called the Sunday Breakfast Rescue Mission Dedication Contract. Our name's a little cooler today. And it said, if you want to be a part of this, you've got to show up three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, at 6 a.m. and you have to be on time. And you need to come with a positive attitude and support and respect your teammates. I didn't look at these guys and say, I get it, you're homeless. You can't possibly show up three days a week. If you make it one day a week, that would be great. And you're probably going to be late, but if you can try not to be too late, I'd really appreciate that. I looked at these guys and demanded nothing but pure excellence from them. And it was almost as if they were waiting for someone to do that. They looked at me, they looked at each other, and we all signed that piece of paper that night. And we had our first run together on July 3rd. I had some really good media contacts in Philly, and I thought this was such a fun story. And plus, I had to get people involved, because soon I have to go take this, com this, this job for this corporation. And uh, I called them and tell them what's going on, and they had the same reaction. Homeless people do not run. There is no way that this is happening. <laughs> if you think about homelessness, and you think when I say that word, people usually get an image in their head. And they usually think of words like dangerous, smelly, drinking, paper bag, shopping cart, doesn't want to work and definitely doesn't want to work hard. When you think of the word runner, you might think of ambitious, disciplined, focused, reliable, type A. And these two things just did not go together for anybody. So I show up this morning, I show up early, all the guys are already outside, the media is on the other side of the street, almost as if the president was in town, every single news station and newspaper had to know the answer to their burning question. Why these homeless guys are running? So they go over and they ask them and they get the most obvious of answers. Because I wanted to see if I was any good at this. I wanted to try something new. I wanted to get healthy. I wanted to meet some new people. Same answers that anybody in this room would give for trying something new. We all ran a mile together that day. Some of us ran it, some of us walked it, and some of us crawled it, but we got our mile in. And these people, after these media stories started to get on TV and in the paper, people started calling and emailing and wanting to come run with us. And pretty soon there's 20 people on the corner of 13th and Vine in Philly, the most unlikely group of people that you ever would see that shouldn't have been at the same place at the same time on purpose. Our backgrounds were very different. Upbringings, drug use, jail time, realities, income, race, religion, you name it. But we all had something in common now. We were all runners. 